my name is John Foster, and uh, I, I threw a couple things in there about me. I'm a, probably like you guys, I'm a, I'm a lifetime CTE person. Anyway, um, what we're going to be talking about is basically the, you know, the National Research Center and, as you can see there, the big picture, kind of, you know, its mission, its partners, and that kind of thing. We'll talk about uh, my chunk of the research that we did. I shouldn't say my chunk, but my team's chunk. Uh, which is CTEDI, which uh, stands for Career Technical Education, uh, Career Technical Educators uh, Using Data-Driven Improvement Models. And then we'll talk about Heather's section uh, on alternative teacher certification. And it, it's nice that Chicago's here because Chicago was one of the original pilots for the CTEDI process about, uh, I think it was probably three years or four years ago, something like that. So um, I don't know if you were in the classroom then or not or where you were, but anyway, whoops. Little trigger, trigger happy on the buttons. Um, you've probably seen these kind of slides before, but this is kind of a, this is a slide that I that I uh, took from Ove, the, the folks at the uh, Office of Vocational Adult Ed. But basically, it kind of lays out, uh, at least uh, in word, where the you know the current administration is going. Uh, the, you know, you have the the president, Arne Duncan, and a couple quotes on on down the line. But it gives you the sense that um, at least uh, in writing, and you know, in some of the comments that. This administration is kind of focused on, uh, you know, college and career readiness, which kind of jives. The reason I threw that slide is because it kind of jives with the National Research Center's mission. Most of you know that the National Research Center is redone uh, every time Perkins is reauthorized. And uh, this time around, when uh, Perkins IV rolled in, the uh, center was established at University of Louisville. And, you know, I know most of you probably already know this. You probably know Jim Stone's the director and all that sort of thing. But... What you may not have had a chance to look at is its actual mission statement, and that's on the slide there for you just to, again, kind of give you a flavor for how this all came about. I think the important thing, and I, I say this to every audience I talk to about the National Research Center, uh, even though the funding streams are changing and things like that right now, um, I've been around CT a long time, and, you know, I've watched the centers move, you know, from Berkeley to Ohio State and Ohio State and Minnesota and all those kind of places. But they've always been focused on major universities, and it's always been a team of major universities. Um, this time around, what Jim Stone was able to do was convince the folks in the Office of Vocational and Adult uh, Education that we really needed a field-based component. So when you look at the National Research Center, if you haven't stopped by their booth or you haven't talked to them or it's not something that's been on your radar, um, this is what you find. These are the partners. Now, you know, we got, we got Cornell, we got University of Minnesota, we got Clemson, we got University of Louisville. So we got the universities, the typical university kind of players. But what you won't see, what you haven't seen up until these last four or five years was the other organizations. You got the state directors, you know, which kind of represents the CT policy makers at the state level. You've got uh, ACT, which, you know, arguably represents the majority of the population in, in CTE. You've got NOCTI, which is, you know, who I represent, uh, AED, and uh, SREB, uh, you know, Gene Bottoms organization. So you've got a mix of university research kind of organizations, and you've got some field-based organizations. And that's important because one of the tags that, that Jim wanted to get to was to be able to disseminate information from the National Center and not keep it locked away in books and things like that. So the idea was to take research, do real scientific research, which is what the last two administrations have all been about do real hardcore, you know, scientific comparison kind of research, uh, meets the rigors of all the, you know, AERAs and all those kind of people, but be able to translate that into professional development or into something that the field can actually use. Uh, you've seen it in the math and CTE programs, the literacy and CTE, and that's kind of where the piece that I'm going to talk to you about today kind of fits. Um, so let's start with this. Um, if, you, if you go ahead and Google, you know, professional development, what you'll find is, is that kind of a definition. And when you look at the uh, OVE model, you know, their, their program of study design uh, framework, you kind of get the picture that professional development kind of ties to all the different areas that, uh, that they're kind of talking about. I'm not going to dwell on that too much, but what I do want to do is um, talk a little bit about the research, because when we, when we did the research back a couple years ago for the professional development part, uh, this career technical educators using data-driven improvement models, we did a lot of, um, well, we, we did survey research, we did literature reviews, we did, you know, uh, mega-analysis, we did all kinds of little research pieces, we did some comparisons, 
But what you find when you look at the literature <coughs> is that, of course, professional development has to be continuous and ongoing. It's not that one-shot stage on stage kind of thing. It's got to be contextual to, to the work of the teacher. It's got to be integrated with uh, what the teacher actually does. And when we started to look around at what's out there for CTE, for, pro for professional development, if there's any research that's been done in CT professional development, guess what? There was none. There's nothing out there that's, that's academically based research on professional development that's focused on CTE. So a lot of the stuff we drew from was the regular ed side, both at the uh, you know, post-secondary level and the secondary level. But we also drew from other work from the, from the uh, National Research Center. Anyway, these are the things we know for sure through the research. Um, there has to be an analysis on, a, on, there has to be an emphasis on analysis and reflection, which you know. Um, there has to be active engagement that uh, reflects adult learning principles, you know, why people learn, how they learn, how their motivation works. There has to be collaborative communities of practice, you know, kind of ties to that continuous and ongoing. Um, you know, if you do one little exercise on, you know, Columbus Day, if you have a common in service or something like that, chances are you're not going to remember it. But if you have mentors working with you and people working with you along the way, you know, it, it helps to reinforce the, uh, the things that you've learned. And it's got to be connected to student improvement and learning because that's really what we're all about. So those were the things that we tried to incorporate into this uh, professional development model. So you got the kind of concept, right? You know where we kind of were headed here. And I'm, I'm not going to talk to you from a research perspective. I'm going to talk to you more about the pieces of the model and, you know, kind of pause and ask if you have questions and things like that. So this is our little, uh, our little piece for <laughs> National Research Center. As you can tell, I'm kind of a quirky guy. So, you know, when we, when we got to the acronym C-Teddy, we said, oh, C-Teddy, kind of like teddy bear, you know. But it, not only did we use that acronym because of the, the, the letters that it stood for, we used it because we thought, ah, oh, teddy bears, soft, cuddly. Nobody's afraid of teddy bears, but some people are afraid of data. So we tried to get that whole touchy-feely kind of thing. I know it's cutesy, but, you know, it seems to be working. So anyway, so what is it? Um, it's, it's three years of research through the National Research Center, uh, piloting, iterative reviews, and all that sort of thing. And it ended up uh, being a, uh, a process, an intervention, let's call it for the time being that um, the National Research Center delivered as a technical assistance program on a cost recovery kind of basis that states can get involved in or large school systems or really even single school districts or you know, school entities, whatever, you call, whatever, you wanna, whatever they're called in your individual state. So the training's interactive. Uh, it's a process, not a one-time event. So you can see we're kind of capitalizing on the professional development things. This is the key though, this third one. It uses data that teachers and schools own. So, Remember I said there was no real research done in CTE professional development. Um, the, the, the main reason is CTE teachers end up, you know, using other people's data. They're forced to use uh, data from regular ed, you know, math uh, uh, tests and things like that. What we did with this process is we focused on technical stuff. We focused actually on looking at a, a pre-assessment based on technical skills and um, kind of doing like a, a little individual education plan for the teacher based on that technical pre-assessment. That's really what it is. It's a, it's a matter of developing an action plan based on a pre-assessment. So <clears throat> what it, what it kind of looks like is we, uh, we gave states who were involved in this thing a chance to pick a pre-assessment of a technical skill area. You know, it could have been anything. Could have been business, could have been a, a, a technical area, you know, a, a, could have been health, you know, could have been any cluster. But essentially, they had to find a, a pre-assessment that was third party, that was reliable and validated, that gave them um, granular enough results to be able to do something about it. Um, I happen to be from Nocti, as, as you probably know, and um, most of the folks ended up selecting a Nocti pretest. I have to be careful because this isn't a sales pitch or anything like that, but the idea is that you've got to be able to look at your overall content, whatever your content is, and you've got to be able to look early on at specific pieces, you know, like maybe it's sanitation, safety, blueprint reading, even if they're, you know, big picture kind of headings. You've got to have data on where your class is as a whole as, you know, in, in the technical field. You know, you're able to get maybe reading scores and math scores and things like that, but we start with the technical data. So that's a, that's a big piece to this whole thing, um, getting technical ass assessment data up front. 
We did find in a couple of states that the, uh, the nurse aid uh, state assessments that some folks use. Are there any health people in here? Anybody? Okay, well, anyway, some of the, uh, some of the health tests the state use actually have um, granular enough data that you can use for improvement, and they will actually let you in some states use the state licensure test as kind of a pretest. So if you have, I don't know, a two-year program or three-year program, you can give it to your incoming sophomores or juniors and kind of get a baseline of where they are as a class. And then you use that data to formulate your action plan. Well, anyway, I got kind of sidetracked. So where I left off was the data that teachers and schools actually own is the important piece. The teacher has to own the data. It's got to be theirs. It's got to have meaning to them. Um, and it, <clears throat> the other thing that we tried to do with this CTEDI process is that we tried to build on a, an ever-increasing community of practice. The idea is that um, um, the indiv individual teacher in the classroom wouldn't be an island unto themselves. They would have an opportunity to interact with other people within the school system and within the state and even across state lines. Uh, at least that's the way the, you know, the pilot research was set up. And the idea was that there would be ongoing support for mentorship, local coaches, and, and help online. And this tells you a little bit about the origin, and I, I kind of skimmed that a little bit, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time uh, talking about that, but those are the pieces of research that, uh, you know, were, were behind this thing. And if you're, if you're interested in really digging into the research part, you can go on the National Research Center site and, you know, look at all the, you can look at the podcasts, you can look at the, you know, the reports that were filed with Congress, you can look at all kinds of stuff. But essentially, this is the part that I wanted to kind of convey to you folks, because I'm assuming you're interested in the, the procedure and not the, the background kind of stuff. So CTEDI is pretty simple. It just consists of five steps, and we adapted them from a number of different sources. It's kind of a quality, you know, continuous improvement model. It's not rocket science. But again, the idea, the key is that you're, you're focusing on technical data, and that's unusual for, you know, for CT teachers. I mean, you wouldn't think it would be, but you're starting with technical data, and then you're analyzing that data. And then what you're doing is that third step is you're verifying and what we call triangulating the data. So you're bringing in the regular ed data um, as a supplement to the technical data as opposed to the other way around. You look at the math data and you drag in the technical data and you say, well, you know, Johnny's not doing well in math because he, you know, whatever. Uh, so that's, that's an important uh, distinction too, that verify and triangulate piece. Um, I'll just do a little bit of bird walk here if you don't mind. I, I do a lot of you know, professional development in my, in my work life these days. And I was, in a, uh, I was in a school system, and I won't tell you the state or the school or anything like that, but they had a pretty much a whole changeover of administration. And um, they had been long-time NOCTI test users, post-test users. They hadn't used pre-tests or any of that kind of thing. So they had a lot of technical assessment data, and these guys and girls just found this data, and they, and they said, uh, we were looking through this data as an administrative team, you know, and, and uh, we noticed something, and we'd like to have you come down and talk to us about the data. And so I, you know, I made arrangements. It was close to where I happened to live. Uh, wasn't, in, wasn't in the state that I live, but anyway, it was near enough to drive. So I went, and um, what we found was in all the kind of, I don't know, blue collarish areas like the welders and the carpenters and even the machinists and some of the auto mechanics, those, those kind of trades, what they found across this entire system, and this is a couple years ago too, so across the entire system, the uh, grades, grades, the, the, the post-tests in the safety components were like low, like across the board. I mean, it wasn't a consistent number, but you could see it was lower than all their ma other major duty categories. And you start thinking, geez, how come our kids aren't doing well in safety? Something that's supposed to be common to so many different areas. Well, <clears throat> this verify and triangulate piece, until you start pulling other pieces of data, you can't tell from the NOCTI data alone. They were looking at NOCTI data, which basically said, you know, here's, here's the carpentry stuff. It's, uh, you know, it's uh, foundations, it's wall framing, it's floor framing, it's safety, it's blueprint reading, it's interior trim, it's exterior trim, and all that kind of thing. Um, that doesn't tell you, you know, too much about, um, you know, why the safety score is low until you start looking at other data. The other data that they finally figured out was they had an administrative policy in place um, that indicated that uh, teachers had to do emergency lesson plans at the time. And that's fairly common, you know, so if you're going to be out and something happens, your boiler explodes or something, you've got to stay home for half a day and you, have to, you don't have time to prepare lesson plans, you have these emergency lesson plans on file. Well, guess what? All the blue-collar teachers were doing safety lessons. And they put them in like safety videos or they put them in a little canned lesson. So the substitute comes in and they're teaching this canned lesson on videos or 
they did it like the day before a holiday, the day before Christmas. So consequently, the kid didn't put any emphasis on the importance of safety, so consequently their scores were low. My point, though, is not so much that. My point is that until you look at other data, other intervening data, whether it's you know, regular ed um, data like in math or in reading or something like that, but also other data that's available to you at the school, you know, your attendance data, um, you know, your, your policies, your, your, your administrative policies. You just don't know what's causing that score to be low. Um, you know, all those kinds of things. There's, so there's kind of external things and internal things you kind of look at. Anyway, based on those first three steps, you kind of design an action plan. Um, you know, so let's pick something simple and something common. You know, uh, uh, I'm a, my background is originally construction, so I tend to gravitate to that kind of, those kind of examples. But, you know, blueprint reading, again, is a fairly common kind of thing. So blueprint reading, let's say the, the students, uh, you know, you see in the pretest that students are scoring poorly on that. Well, why is that? Is there some kind of visual problem that they're, they're having trouble reading the blueprint? Is it that they don't understand the symbols? Is there some kind of, you know, mental connection that's, that's fouling up? Is it a math problem? Is it that they don't understand how to convert metrics to, you know, fractions or whatever? You, you don't know why they're scoring low at the onset because instruction hasn't really occurred yet. So you know it's not your instruction that's, that's wrong. You know that it's something else and you want to try to triangulate to figure what that is. So, you know, one of the first places you would go if that's what you found is maybe the math scores. You take a look at the math scores. Is there a consistent pattern with the kids in your class that, you know, maybe they had problems, like I said, converting fractions to decimals or something like that. Maybe that's an impact. But there's all kinds of things you could look at to come up with an action plan that you as the, uh, as the teacher in the classroom could focus on to change that pretest score of blueprint reading being low throughout the process of your program. So that's the idea. You design an action plan and then you meet with a, a learning community within your school consisting of maybe one or two other teachers who are doing a similar kind of thing as well as an administrator and you kind of um, meet but not necessarily face to face. We tried to make this as uh, non-obtrusive as we possibly could. So you know you can do it via email, you can do it you know by Skype, you can do it by you know whatever you need to do. It doesn't have to be a face to face interaction. And then the other thing we did was we incorporated this little thing. I know it's a terrible slide, but it's kind of like our version of uh, Facebook, though it's not nearly as sophisticated, obviously. Um, my, my IT folks at, at NOCTI contributed their time to the National Research Center to just put together this little project, and we'd load it up on one of our servers. And basically what happens is the people who are involved in the project, we take your picture, we, we tell you what your position is. I, again, you probably can't see it from there, but like it says teacher, and then underneath of it it says what your location is. That one, I think, says Clearfield, Pennsylvania. So we don't put your name or anything like that on it, but um, as you can see, you can, yeah, her name is actually in the, in the email out, out further, but we have, we have tweaked that since. But the idea is that <coughs> folks get on there and they share action plans back and forth, and they can communicate back and forth. It's not, a, it's not rocket science again, but it, it makes the teacher feel like they're not the only ones in the classroom, you know, standing out there by themselves, and that, you know, they have help out there, and they, uh, they're going through this action planning process, and, uh, you know, there's some things that they may be able to benefit by uh, other teachers in their state who are going through the same process or other people in other states who are going through the process. So that's a piece of it, too. Um, this is kind of what it looks like from a kind of a, that's another terrible slide, at least the colors are terrible. But anyway, that's kind of a, a macro version of the ideal implementation, the way it was kind of designed. So what you have is, of course, the center, the National Research Center is Jim's name, and then you have the, uh, the uh, National Research Center um, uh, PIs, the, the investigators, myself and Carol and, and Pat and Sandy. And then we have the, uh, <coughs> what we have is national facilitators. So what would happen is, at the state level, if this thing was to be implemented in a particular state, what we ask for is two people from the state level, um, one who's kind of a, um, a well-recognized figure within the state, could have been a retiree, could have been a, an outstanding teacher, could have been a uh, I don't know, uh, an executive uh, of your administrative association or something like that. But the key is, what we found in the research was that people respect people from within their state more than they respect people from outside their state. So it's not like you're flying over and dumping this thing on somebody. It's somebody within your state is actually supporting it. So that's the idea there. We also ask for a state administrator to be involved, somebody who understands data. And, and that way, you kind of have 
um, a, a little bit of oversight of where the project is. It's kind of a little bit like the, the high schools at work model. Those of you that have high schools at work in your state, you know that you have a, a high schools at work person who's kind of keeps you in touch with high schools at work stuff. But the idea is <clears throat> those two people go to a national training center at the uh, University of Louisville and those two people um, do a couple of things. They figure out what areas the state wants to focus on in terms of um, what content areas. We don't try to do the whole state, obviously, at once. We pick a couple of, uh, couple of content areas. And typically in most states at this, at this point, states have figured out that there's priority in high wage, high demand kind of you know, occupations. So different states have different priorities. So one of the reasons that state folks are involved is so that there, if there is a state policy statement that says we're really focusing on, I don't know, health programs in the state or really focusing on STEM programs in the state and we want all the STEM teachers to participate, you know, they have that input and the ability to kind of select which programs. Plus it makes sense because that way you have common teachers in common schools in common content area. Uh, it doesn't have to be that way. That's just the ideal way that the thing was designed. So that's why those people are involved. And they keep tabs on the, you know, what we're calling the state facilitator. The state facilitator is the key person in the state who's been through the training, who is the person who coordinates with what we said at the time were 10 schools or 10 school entities. Those are those orange blocks. And in each of those 10 entities, there's three to five content teachers and uh, an administrator who understands the process and goes through the training. So one of the, idea, one of the reasons there's 10 schools is because in an average size state, um, it takes about that portion of the population to kind of keep the grassroots fires kind of going. It wasn't just an arbitrary number. I mean, it's, it's a little bit arbitrary. I mean, it could be 8 to 12 or something like that. Or maybe if you're in a state like California, it's 30. I don't know. But, but that's kind of the common average. Like if you're in a, a mid-range kind of state, you need about 10 schools to have this thing catch fire and to you know, kind of carry on. It's kind of what they found through the math and CT projects. That's kind of where that research came from. So that's why there's 10. But that's kind of a quick overview of the, of the process. And what, what it looks like in terms of a timeline, I don't know if I have, uh, let me just look here. No, I jumped right into benefits. But in terms of a timeline, the, um, the, the, basically what happens is there's a pretest that occurs sometime before usually October. And then sometime in the time frame of October to November, there's a, a full meeting of all these folks. So let's say there's three, let's say there's, I don't know, let's say there's 10 schools and there are three content teachers. So you've got 30 teachers that come together in one common meeting. It's really the only time throughout the year they'll actually meet one another. They meet one another, they see one another, they get to uh, uh, have their pretest results revealed to them and get the action plan steps all at the same time. So it's kind of like a full day training. And because the state's involved, usually it can be done at maybe a, you know, whatever is a, a common meeting ground in your particular state, whether it's you know, in your state headquarters, if you have such a place, or it's in a large community college, or it's in a, you know, a big auditorium, whatever. But some place where these people can get together and spend the day working. Um, we usually send somebody from the National Center in to explain the, res the, the, the results of the, the pretest if they haven't been through that kind of thing before. But um, that's essentially what happens. And then we try to get the action plans developed before the, the winter break or the Christmas break and get them thrown up on the action planning site. And then basically the rest of the thing is iterative reviews to those action plans to see how they're doing. To see if, well, if you pick blueprint reading, um, what, what little formative clues are you getting along the way in January and February and March that you're making progress in blueprint reading. Um, and then that's essentially the way the process rolls. Um, you, can, you can utilize a post-test if you want to. That's not a, that's not a mandatory piece of the, the puzzle. Uh, but that's a possibility. So lots of benefits to it. And, you know, some of them uh, are listed up there. One of the things that we always get dinged on, we as a CT community get, gets dinged on, is those, uh, you know, islands of excellence and, you know, that we don't have full, cons you know, full data across the board. Uh, so uh, that islands of excellence comment should be edited out of the video. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. The... Uh, <clears throat> This, this kind of thing would give us a consistent evaluation across the CT community. Um, essentially, we implemented in, um, in five states in the, you know, in the pilot phase, um, and then we actually rolled it out this year 
two states to you know take it on as professional development. We have two states involved in the process right now. Minnesota and Maine are the two states that are involved. And uh, we have four states that are probably going to jump in next year. Uh, and I can talk about them later on if you want to. But anyway, that's the benefits. These are some of the, the ways you can participate. Um, you can do a statewide implementation, which is the way the project was designed. You can do a jump start, which is what we did in a pre-session here at ACT. We do them at uh, Career Clusters Institute. We do them at high schools at work. We do them at tech centers at work. And we do them uh, here at, at uh, ACTE. So we do these one to two day jump start kind of things where we give you fake data. Um, the problem is, like we said, the research shows that you've got to have your own data. So these little jump starts aren't ideal. They're more a, 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 a way to understand what the process is. But because you, own, you don't have your own data, it's like, well, you know, okay, so what? Um, so the, the, the two on this side of the screen, the introductory professional development and the jump start are great if you want to get familiar with the process. But if you really want to get intimate with the data and you want to make the research actually work, you need to have your own data to, to make the thing happen. So we've done, I don't know, I, I think we've done about five jump starts now since last year when we started technical assistance. We've done um, a number of introductory one-day professional developments at school systems and community colleges and things like that. We have an IES grant in right now, which we're hoping we get funded on, which will take this CTEDI process and apply it to the community college level. Uh, we don't know if that's going to you know, fly or not, but uh, because of the differences between secondary populations and post-secondary populations, we want to take a look at that stuff too. At the same time we were doing our work, uh, SREB was doing their work, and, and the, the background to their work was that, uh, well, teachers come into this profession by all sorts of ways. Um, you know, some of you are in business, some of you are in ag, some of you are in, you know, uh, technical areas. So some of you had the fortunate uh, luck to come through, uh, you know, a four-year training program where you got a bachelor's degree and you were certified to teach in your state and all that kind of thing. Not everybody in CT is like that. Um, you know, welders, uh, carpenters, you know, those kind of folks come in directly from the trade in a lot of cases. And even, you know, in the health professions, and it just depends on your state and your certification regs. Well, <clears throat> from, a, from a kind of big picture perspective, um, you know, back when we were in the 70s and 80s, a number of states had uh, formalized certificate programs that you could work through some, you know, some colleges and, and, and get an alternative uh, certification. Well, because of dwindling numbers and things like that, a lot of states kind of collapsed those programs. Uh, I, I come from a state that, you know, it still does it, fortunately, but um, um, I know an awful lot of states don't. And the reason I know what states do those kinds of things is because, again, switching hats for a second, NOCTI does provide um, about 23 states, I should say 23 universities in 23 states, um, the use of what we call teacher tests. So in some states, um, teacher competence is gauged by, you know, knock the tests. And we can tell by the, 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 the slow number, uh, the, the, the dwindling number of um, teacher tests that have been given over the last 10 years that states just aren't using them anymore. It's mostly because, you know, teacher certification institutions are kind of collapsing because of lack of enrollment or lack of funding or lack of all kinds of things. So how are we getting our certified teachers in the last, you know, five, six years, particularly in states that don't have a program that's out there certifying teachers alternatively? That's the, that's the genesis of this uh, SREB program. So the idea was, uh, you know, to develop a model of teacher certification that, whoops, sorry, you know, that helped prepare teachers to stay in the field. Um, we know that there are states out there, I can, matter of fact, uh, I think they did a presentation here, probably today. California, for example, has a program called CTE Teach. I don't know if any of you are aware of it or so what. If you get a chance and you're interested, you know, again, Google it. But essentially what California found out under the Schwarzenegger years was that CTE teachers in particular kind of burned out within years one through three if they didn't have, uh, you know, a bachelor's degree going in or they didn't have, a, you know, a, a formal um, background in teaching you know, in delivering content. And there's lots of reasons for that, they found out, you know, but uh, uh, among them was the inability to talk to somebody about what it is that they do. You know, it, it, it's, it's still kind of the old model, you know, when the teacher goes in and closes the door, they're still kind of by themselves. And if they don't have a support system, you know, they kind of burn out. You know, they get focused on one thing and trying to do it right, and they forget about all the other things, and they, you know, they just kind of crash and burn. 
So <clears throat> that's the reason for this uh, model. So the idea was that some of the high schools that work states um, would, have this, would have this project that would uh, enable folks to at least have this. If they didn't have a university um, helping them stay in the profession and they didn't have a, a California CTE teach model, they'd have something like this. And you can see, uh, and you all know this if you're in a profession and, if, and you've been in it for more than you know, five years, um, the, the CTE teacher responsibility, just like every teacher's responsibility, is just going through the roof. Um, you know, the challenges are listed there on the right-hand side, and um, I'm not even going to bother talking about those. So what, what uh, the, the researchers at SREB did under the auspices of the National Research Center, using National Research Center money, was they did the same kind of thing we did. They did the survey analysis. They looked at all the models out there for professional development. They took a look at the good models. They, look at, they looked at current models, and they put them all together to come up with uh, an intervention very similar to what we did. Uh, they're one year behind us in the implementation piece, so they would be rolling out their thing. Um, well, they, they, they would be starting to advertise their thing um, right now. So they have pilot sites out there that are doing this, this kind of work. But this is the rigor <coughs> of their professional development projects. If you, if you look at it, uh, and if you can read that, it's uh, a 10-day summer institute um, prior to the year that, um, you know, year one teaching, if you can do that. I mean, if you can identify the teachers. Uh, I know back when I was associated with hiring teachers, that was sometimes a difficult thing to do because sometimes you were hiring a teacher, you know, <laughs> two weeks out before the school year. But if you have the teacher identified, you know, the prior year before teaching, and if they're coming in from an area where they don't have a background in teaching, they have a 10-day seminar that they've, that they've um, put together. And then you can see the follow-up. Very similar to the, the, you know, the, the uh, professional development models, uh, the, uh, the concepts that I showed you on the second slide. You know, you've got this ongoing mentorship. So you see there are three uh, two-day follow-ups uh, during year one of your teaching year. So you have somebody that's helping you, um, you know, get through that first year. And then the... Uh, <clears throat> The next, the next time around, you can see you have a 10-day summer institute. That's at the end of your year one. And then you have some one-hour one hour webinars kind of thrown in there, too. The whole idea is to make sure that you're comfortable with the education delivery part, the, you know, not so much the content, but the uh, uh, pedagogy. So, sorry, I was jumping ahead of myself there. But again, you see support from the building administrator. Um, so it's that mentored kind of you know, experience. And this is all because they learned the same things in their research that we learned in ours. Oops. And same thing, electronic communities of practice. Not the same way we did it, but the same ongoing communication kind of style. So this is kind of their focus, their, their focus points um, in, in those, um, whatever that was, 24 days of uh, training or so that they go through. The focus on instructional planning the focus on strategies, you know, the, the big picture kind of stuff, the focus on classroom assessment. You know, not, you know I, I, I neglected to mention when I was talking about C. Teddy, the two, the two driving factors in that C. Teddy project were, was to give the instructor two things. Give them a feeling that they understood um, assessment terminology um, and also to give them a feeling of knowing how to look at a chart and a graph and knowing what to do with it. So those were the two points of teacher knowledge that we were trying to build through the CTEDI process. You can see that there's a, a little teeny weeny bit of overlap, but, but not really so much end the program. The classroom assessment, if you can read it from where you are, talks about formative assessments and feedback ongoing as opposed to end the program, pre-program kind of thing. And then, of course, the, the classroom management. And again, you see the reflection piece down at the back, down at the bottom down there. These were the four pieces that SREB found through research that were important to, you know, sustain in, sustaining the teacher. They went through the same iterative kind of development process. So their, uh, their field testing, uh, year three and four, and then this actually is year five uh, for them. And they're hoping, I think they're beta testing right now. If Heather was here, she could tell you for sure. But I believe what they're doing is kind of beta testing right now with this whole model and professional development. Does anybody happen to be familiar that they're using it in your state? Are you? Okay, so you've been a field test model. Okay. I, uh, <clears throat> what happens with me, and the, the disadvantage of not having Heather here, of course, is I know Heather's research, but I don't know her implementation. So, you know, I, I know how it was formed. I get, 
you know, the, the, the entities that you saw on that slide with the, you know, the United States map um, see each other twice a year, and we, you know, keep each other up to speed on where we are at the research part, but not so much the implementation pieces, because we don't, you know, we don't just, we, we just are involved in our other projects. Anyway, so those are the, those are the conditions to implement the model. Um, you know, in terms of uh, making sure that there's uh, proper selection and training of instructors, who participates, you know, how many, that kind of thing. Um, the incentives, how, the, how you work that piece out, and I know that came up in our work too. You know, if, if you're going to pull teachers out of the classroom to do something, whatever it is, is it going to be a policy issue where you, where you must pay them? Is it something where you can do, you know, quid pro quo, all those kinds of issues? Uh, and is there commitment? You know, that last bullet, commitment to ongoing evaluation. Because this is a research um, model. And then here's, uh, here's, here's their what's next kind of slide. Um, they are still, as you know, you know, collecting data on how this thing is working out. But I, I guess the message I'd want to make sure that I conveyed, you know, on behalf of Heather was the research on this thing was solid um, and the, the time that they're taking with their field test is solid. I know... Uh, this is probably a kind of inside the tent kind of kind of discussion, but Jim was pushing hard to get us to go to technical assessment, uh, sorry, technical assistance uh, fairly quickly. But um, you know, SREB is a very uh, detail-oriented uh, organization, and they really stuck to their guns and went through a number of iterative reviews over the years. So they're still in the process, I believe, of of tweaking the thing before they actually roll it out as a, a technical assessment piece. And you can see they're they're piling the modules with um, you know. Uh, veteran teachers to, to see if they would actually work. The only other kinds of things that I have for you, um, just to mention, are you know, resources from the center itself. Um, again, if you haven't looked at the National Resource Research Center, you know, please take a look at it. And uh, you know, there's, there really is a ton of good research out there that, that's actually uh, classroom applicable. 